Hello students, welcome to another exciting session on the Psychologist NG TV with me, Dr. Blessing Ntamu. I hope you've been doing well as always. Today we are going to further our discussion even more on motivation. And today we will be discussing the educational implications of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs or self-actualization theory. And after that, we'll look at the characteristics of a self-actualized person and then some behaviors that could lead to self-actualization. Actually, whilst he was uh, studying or uh, propounding this theory, Abraham Maslow examined the behavior of some individuals, some select individuals that he considered to be self-actualized persons, such, like, such as Theodore Roosevelt, such as um, Abraham Lincoln, such as uh, Albert Einstein, and the likes of those. And it was from his study of these people that he came up with his self-actualization theory. So let's look at the educational implications of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs theory. So what are the educational implications of the hierarchy of needs theory? It's quite straightforward. As teachers, we must understand that except the basic needs of our students are met, their cognitive needs cannot be met. So for instance, if you have a child that is having a tummy ache that is hungry and his tummy is growling and you're trying to teach that child some uh, uh, theory of science or something, the child is not likely to understand until the pangs of hunger have been satisfied. So we must ensure that our students' basic needs, their need for food, their need for safety and security, their love and belonging needs and their self-esteem needs are met before we begin to try to meet their cognitive needs, before we begin to try to impact knowledge and get them to understand, you know, some intellectual stuff. So we must ensure that the school is a safe haven, is a safe environment. Children feel, or learners feel safe, they feel loved, they feel accepted, and that they're not hungry, they're not cold, for instance, before we try to teach them. In trying to achieve this as teachers or facilitators of learning, uh, we need to sometimes collaborate with the parents, with the, the, our learners' parents, you know, with the community, uh, with the government, just to ensure that these basic needs are met so that our children can come to school feeling um, ready to learn. Because without meeting these needs, they may not really be able to learn. So when a child comes to school, if they were, the weather is cold, ensure that he's warm. If he's hungry, ensure that the child is fed, you know, communicate with the parents, communicate with the society to ensure all of this, then we can begin to impact knowledge. Now, the second um, implication I want to point out, you know, that's actually really salient is that for someone to be self-actualized and to maximize their potential, they have to first of all be aware of their potentials. So there's something that I tag uh, aspiration, motivation. You have to uh, motivate the student to aspire. You have to provide an environment where the student can identify their potentials so that they can begin to aspire to their potentials. Some children are under aspire, you know, because they are under motivated. For instance, whilst I was carrying out a research uh, on cognitive restructuring with some primary school children, I had uh, the occasion to ask them what they wanted to be in the future. And one learner's uh, response stood out for me. This little boy said, what he wanted was actually to be someone that would be ordered around. He wanted to be told to do this or to do that. And he would just do it. For instance, he wanted to be told to cut grass. He wanted to be told to sweep the floor. I mean, there's nothing wrong with wanting to sweep the floor or wanting to cut grass, but there's something wrong with not having any aspirations of your own and waiting to be told what to do by someone else. So we found out that that child has been uh, under motivated to aspire and well, we try to deal with that within the short period that we had. So let us uh, motivate our children to aspire. Let us try to help them identify their potentials, uh, their, their, their abilities, you know, and their talents, and then help them grow that, help them develop their talents, and that will do. Now let's look at some behaviors that can lead to self-actualization. One, you have to be able to experience life like a child, full of absorption and concentration. You must be very hardworking and you must be ready to take responsibility for your actions. You must be original and follow unconventional paths instead of following the crowd. You must be able to identify your defenses and then to overcome them or to go beyond them. Now you must be honest and avoid pretense. 
And you must also be ready to be unpopular when your views do not align with the views of other people. Now, these are just a few of the behaviors that can actually engender self-actualization. And with this, we come to the end of our discussion of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs theory or the self-actualization theory. I want you to go and look at this theory critically and come up with some criticisms of this theory. You can also read about some criticisms of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs theory as a motivational theory. Like I said again, dare to dream, aspire to your highest potentials. That's the only way that you can fulfill your maximum potential. Until we meet again in the next class, have an amazing day ahead. Bye.